okay, the exploration stories keep coming. Um, for my uh, interesting company with uh, a portfolio of assets, uh, that's we'll be looking at the, uh, uh, the Western U USA uh, uranium assets. Uh, with, uh, more um, a concentration on those. But uh, Mark McGarry is here today, a non-executive director for, th for mining and has uh, a geological background, but uh, a, a long-standing love of uh, all, things, uh, all things mining and uh, having that diverse background and reactivating some of those original mines from uh, post-World War II there, looking, looking quite interesting out there. But um, uh, so we're moving to the US from, uh, from other parts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to PAC Partners for uh, inviting me to come along. Uh, our managing director, Nicole galloway Warland, unfortunately is in um, London at the moment, uh, but she spoke uh, on this project uh, last week at the Global Uranium Conference in Adelaide, where uh, I think uh, she got quite an interesting reception. So a little bit about Thor Mining. Um, we're a bit different from most of the other presenters here in that uh, basically we well, until a few years ago, weren't anything to do with uh, uranium mining. Statement. Uh, at the moment, uh, we're uh, working in the, the uh, western US, in uh, western Colorado and Utah. And the things I'm going to talk about are a little bit different from everybody else's. Our grades in this area, somewhere in between some of the ones we've been hearing about in Africa, down in the PPMs, and certainly below the Athabasca, but we're somewhere perhaps in the middle of that, uh, that sort of mix. Just a little bit of background about uh, uh, Thor Mining to give you a, a, a bit of a, uh, an impression of what the company is about. The company was founded originally uh, quite a long time ago in the early 2000s on the Molly Hill um, uh, Tungsten Molly deposit, uh, which we uh, still own up in the Northern Territory. It's a really interesting project, um, but some of the work that's been done, it, it really needs a lot of funding to move this project forward. Uh, it will become important because it is a, a critical uh, metal for us. Also, down in South Australia, we've been involved with ISR mining, not for uranium, but in, uh, in the copper space. So we've been uh, a 30% uh, shareholder in a small private company called uh, Environmental Copper, and they are looking to um, reactivate mining at uh, a small deposit called the Capunda deposit, which is oxide copper. And very recently, Oz Minerals placed uh, a $2.5 million uh, investment into getting the Capunda uh, ISR up and operational um, and getting the full feasibility uh, completed. So Oz Minerals have confidence in getting this work uh, going. Thor Mining, apart from this work with ECR, and I'm actually a director on, on the ECR board, we're also involved in a project called Alfred East, which is on the York Peninsula, where we have a very large uh, deposit of uh, uh, oxide copper, and this is one of the areas where uh, ISR copper probably is going to work in the near future. But the main project that we've been working on um, very recently, and we put a release out very recently, we've got some results back from some gold work in the eastern Pilbara, an area called the Ragged Range. Um, and we've got the first results. We've got uh, four metres at 12.2 grams gold in uh, an area we call Kelly's. Um, this is an, a very uh, important area for developing gold mines uh, in, in the eastern Pilbara. Um, and, and very early days, but we've managed to get a, a small hit there. Taking us back to uranium, why have Thor Mining got involved in uranium? And we have to thank PAC Partners, because they brought, brought this project to Thor Mining uh, about two and a half years ago and said, this is very interesting. Uh, the companies took some time to have a look at it, evaluate it, and work through. And, and the reason that we've got more heavily involved and starting to get some drilling is most of the directors on Thor Mining, myself, I'm an exploration geologist from, started in uranium in 1981. Uh, Nicole Galloway-Warland, she worked on the Samphire deposit, which you're gonna hear about next. 
um, and sh she was part of the discovery team and, and getting that project going. And uh, Alistair Clayton, he was also involved in uh, uh, uranium in Africa uh, through the extract resources, and some people will know him. We're listed both on the AIM and the ASX. A little bit about the US uranium then, get us into some geology. And I've just put those things there because uh, we're trying to present why are we in the US. And the US has virtually no production of uranium. And there's some clear reasons why there has to be uranium mining in the US. Okay, it's very, very important to get uh, uranium mining in the US. They have real difficulties sourcing uh, uranium from r many parts of the world who have very clear guidelines on how uranium should be used. Um, this area is, is well known in uh, geological circles. It's where the first uranium in the US came from. It's a very interesting area, and I'll show you some of the photos. Nicole was over there in September. Quite an interesting area. So this, not what is known as the Uravan Belt, um, it's located in Utah and Colorado. It does go a little bit into a couple of the other states, but most of the action, I suppose, is in Colorado and Utah. And we've got uh, three projects that we talk about, uh, Wedding Bell, uh, Radium Mountain, uh, Vanadium King in Utah. We've not said much about Vanadium King at the moment because that project was found by an oil company and unfortunately their GPSs didn't work very well in those days, were non-existent, and we've still had trouble actually locating where the drill holes were on the ground. They actually reported a resource from this area um, back in the uh, early 80s. Um, one of these places you've got to try and find uh, again. But the other areas uh, we're working quite a lot with. Um, some of the due diligence that we did on the uh, area, I'll talk a little bit about the community first. Uh, some interesting pictures, they make people uh, smile. But one of the things Nicole noted is uh, she went to the uh, local town in this area, first time she'd been there. She felt she didn't have a an accent at all, but everyone knew straight away she was from Australia. Everyone came up to talk with her. Everyone had a relative who'd worked in these uranium mines or their grandfather knew something about it. It's quite an interesting area um, because of the background. Um, and there's still a few of these mines uh, sitting around in this area. Um, this is what the country looks like. It's quite high. Um, we can really work there between about March and, uh, although it's tricky depending on the uh, snow melt, um, probably April till about beginning of December. So that's when we do the work. Um, Nicole went over there very recently um, having a look at some of these deposits. They're an unusual sandstone hosted type deposit. The uranium is quite high grade in very narrow lenses. And these can be mined by uh, room and pillar, and that's how they mine them in this area. Um, pretty high grade. The example in, in Australia um, is where I started my career in 1981, around the Big Ely deposit. They're fairly high grade. They have a lot of vanadium associated with them. The vanadium tends to be both with the uraninite, and we're not talking carnitite here except right at surface, um, but the vanadium and the uranium, the vanadium tends to be over five metres, whereas the uranium tends to be concentrated in half to one metre type intercepts. Um, the, the areas we've been drilling, um, one of the areas we called Section 23, we were really interested in this area, and this is what got my um, uh, excitement about this area. I, I didn't want to look at it initially until I saw this area. This area called Section 23 was held up by the uh, American Atomic Energy Commission, and they wanted to sterilise this area for their own uses. So they didn't allow exploration in here from the 1950s until today. So we're the first people in this area. Um, and you can see it's a very flat-lying um, topography. Uh, the areas we're working in, um, although they're very high, the, the actual uh, surface is very, very flat-lying. Um, and we think we will intersect. And we can't say too much at the moment because we're in the middle of drilling. Uh, usual story with drilling. Um, we drilled some of the section 23. 
We're about to get the uh, radiometric downhole information back, move to a new area, and the drillers, of course, um, shank the bit on the first hole in the groundhog area, and we're having to wait two and a half weeks for new rods, um, new drill bit, those sorts of things. So these are things that happen in exploration. We will have the information coming out, I would think, in the next couple of weeks, we'd be able to put some of the information out about what the sort of uh, mineralisation we're intersecting. A um, little bit of a timeline. It's very difficult at this early stage of exploration to really put a lot of information in. Um, we should get those downhole gamma results. I think we'll certainly be coming out in November. Um, uh, hopefully, we'd like to think they'd come out quicker than that, but we, you, you just can't tell. We, until we finish that drill, drilling program, which we must finish by December the 1st, uh, that's our approval rating. Um, we then spend some time with data interpretation um, and planning for next year, being able to go in there probably in April uh, to do some more drilling. Uh, we've only drilling, we had enough money to drill 15 holes and uh, we've spent the money on this new area and uh, following up some of the old mines in, in the uh, radium, be uh, radium Hill and... Um, uh, Wedding Bell and Radium Mountain, sorry. So this is just a very simple timeline. I think for exploration purposes, we'll be having a lot more information coming out November, December, and then we should get results back from assays. We're, we're assaying certain sections for both vanadium and uranium. And uh, just to let you know, this is the sort of drill rig we've been using. Um, the family owned, uh, came, came down from Wyoming where a lot of the uranium mining um, has slowed down and a lot of your drilling work and we were able to get one of these drill rigs. Um, it can drill down to um, uh, around about 180 metres. Um, they get a bit uh, stuck after that. Um, so thank you very much. Certainly, I've, I've got one. Um, this has fascinated me from reading uh, about the uh, American programs on nuclear energy and, of course, the, uh, the uh, construction of the, the US weapon system for the World War II. But in terms of this area, I mean, we're still looking for very hot, high, modest, sorry, middle to high grade uh, pods and then you put a number of them together. Yes. And then... Yep. And then uh, one one thing I should have pointed out, and I haven't done, is... Um, and I don't like to talk about it too much. In fact, I caught the plane across from Adelaide with Mark Chalmers, who's um, CEO of um, Energy Fuels, and you can see the White Mesa Mill um, uh, isn't too far away. And this is how that company is working. Um, and... Uh, that company is building up a whole series of these small, you call them smaller mines, um, but at reasonably high grade. And not only do you get the value out of the uranium, but the White Mesa Mill um, also produces vanadium. In fact, originally, this area was a vanadium mining area. So you produce both uh, uranium and vanadium from relatively small scale mines, and a number of these will open up. They've got the spot price number that they want to work on, um, and uh, it, it will happen. Uh, one of the things the White Mesa Mill is working on is being able to also extract some rare earths. They haven't got the technique right yet, but they'll get there. <laughs> Something I'm very uh, excited about, and it's a great jurisdiction to be operating. Yep. So yeah. thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.